please keep your micro switch off for the people online. <coughs> and for the people in the room, during the question, you can switch on your micro. And then when you're finished, please switch off uh, so we don't have any echoes. Um, so I'm going to leave the floor to Alice for the safety uh, instructions for the people in person. Thank you, Arlie. Um, hopefully we can see this slide. OK, so we are in um, level minus one of um, Tokopol, um, Sal Congress C. Uh, this is just a photo of the evacuation plan outside the room. So it's literally taken on the right as you go out. In fact, uh, if you move to the next slide, um, this is a close up. Um, dotted red is where we are now. And you'll see the green arrow is the nearest fire exit. It's just out of the, this door you came in on the right, directly uh, straight on. And um, if you hear any alarm, um, please make your way upstairs to the ground level. Uh, and the kind of large area to the left of reception is where the um, assembly area is for muster. Um, and then wait at that point for more information. So there are phone numbers in case of uh, an, a medical emergency or a fire. They're also um, on that poster, but it's 18 on an internal phone for a fire and 15 for a medical emergency. Um, and that's that's it. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, so just to do a quick introduction, here you have the presentation of the board of the EAG uh, local chapter Paris. Um, if you want to commit or help us, please uh, do not hesitate to contact us through our Gmail uh, address. Um, just a quick save the dates for our next events. Uh, the next one will be the 23rd of May. Uh, it will be online about myth and leak detection. And then just below, you have a few other events about uh, on the other EAG local chapters in Europe. If you are interested, do not hesitate to contact them or to connect as they are all online events. Uh, ground rules for tonight. So for all the people online, uh, you are all muted. Uh, better with video off as in the room when cannot see you. Um, so we are recording this event and uh, hopefully we'll be posted uh, it on YouTube later on. Uh, you will be able to ask questions during the presentation for people online. Please write it in the chat and we'll pass it to the speakers. And for the people in the room, do not hesitate to raise your hand and we'll uh, uh, get your questions. That will be Laura and Alice on my left with who are going to manage the question in the room. And I will be managing the questions online. Um, so thank you all for your interest into this event and big thank you to Nicola here, who is in, uh, who is here in, uh, from Polavenia. And uh, we organize this event with them. So thank you to them for helping us. And thank you also to our speakers, Stefano, Arnaud and Grégoire. Uh, I will leave the floor to uh, Nicola for a few slides on Polavenia. Thank you, Aurélie. Hello, everybody. So I'll give you a few quick words about uh, about Avenia. So we are a French uh, uh, a French uh, uh, competitiveness cluster dedicated to subsurface industries. As you can see on the screen, we address uh, today six main uh, sectors, main inquiries, hydrogeology, geotechnics, geothermal energy, oil and gas, and geological storage. We have about uh, 240 members today, located uh, uh, everywhere in France and uh, even further. Uh, they are industrials, mainly SMEs, uh, but also research and training centers and, uh, and association. So we have a different mission. We try to, to promote uh, all the subsurface solution. 
we try to, to contribute to the emergence of uh, collaborative and innovative uh, project and, uh, and so on. To give you only a quick example of our action, we have launched last year uh, Earth2, which is a program of uh, Avenyad. That's a European initiative for subsurface hydrogen. So I mean uh, geological storage and uh, natural hydrogen. And why we launched this program? In fact, we realized that uh, we were not uh, audible uh, in the public debate. Um, the subsurface solutions are not audible. So we always talk about mobility, about uh, electrolysis production, but uh, uh, we, we wanted to push uh, further as a subsurface solution. That's why we created this, uh, this initiative to federate all the subsurface actors and uh, to push our message. And we have started to, to, uh, to uh, we have created different working group to share common knowledge. We are writing a position paper to push those message uh, where we are particip participating to, to different events uh, like uh, the evolution uh, event tomorrow and so on. And here on the last slide, I, uh, I, I list, uh, that's not updated, but uh, I list the, the actual uh, participant members of uh, this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. <coughs> so now I'm going to uh, present our speakers tonight. So first on my right, just here, Stefano. Stefano Bagala has 20 years of experience working in the oil and gas industry for service companies and operators. In his career, he has worked uh, mostly in the design and execution of complex drilling uh, and reservoir management operation in the North Sea, Gulf of Mexico, uh, Algeria, Middle East, and Caspian Sea. He has a PhD in applied geology from the University of Padova in Italy and a Master of Business Administration from Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. He is currently managing uh, director of Director of Batigea, a company that provides consulting uh, services for renew renewables, oil and gas, and mining industry. On my right here, Arnaud Réveillère. Uh, Arnaud Réveillère uh, graduated in engineering school uh, from uh, the school Central Paris in 2008 and holds a PhD in geoscience defended at uh, Sorbonne University in 2021. He has worked uh, four years as a research engineer at BRGM, the French Geological Survey, and then joined Geostock in 2012. He worked on many industrial and R&D projects for storing natural gas, compressed air, or hydrogen in soil caverns. He had been the innovation manager of Geostock for four years and is since 2020 deputy director for Geostock Green Storage, promoting the development of underground storage solution for net zero energy systems. And on my left here, Grégoire Evin. Grégoire is a geomechanical engineer and expert in underground gas storage in soil caverns. After a PhD in geophysics in Laboratoire Central des Ponts et Chaussées, uh, today IFSTAR, he joined Gas de France and Storage to work on soil caverns. Grégoire has supported gas storage operators for more than 20 years in the domain of tightness test, gas filling, caverns volume <coughs> evolution due to soil creep, subsidence, and abandonment of gas storage soil caverns. He was underground project manager for the development of Autrive site in the southeast of France. He has also research and development activities on the thermal and mechanical behavior of salt with different uh, academic partners like uh, Min Paris Tech, Ecole Polytechnique, Leibniz New University in Hanover. And today is a scientific uh, coordinator of the Hipster Project, a pilot experiment of hydrogen storage in a salt cavern. So I'm going to uh, give the hand to our first speaker, uh, Stefano Bergera. If you can give me just two 
minutes, two little minutes. Uh, not here. Uh, thanks, Aurelie, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before to start, I would like to thank uh, EAGE Paris Chapter for inviting me and all of you for your attendance. So the title of my presentation is uh, Large Scale Energy Storage Considerations. Here we have the presentation agenda. So we will start to introduce the concept of uh, energy storage and why we need it. Then uh, we will see the European Union strategy on energy storage. We will introduce the concept of uh, hydrogen storage and compressed air energy storage. We will see one uh, compressed air energy storage plant in operation, Hantorf. And then uh, finally, we will see differences and similarities between hydrogen storage and compressed air energy storage. Then we will draw some conclusions. Okay, so um, we have uh, several uh, technologies for energy storage. Large scale energy storage is characterized by uh, several hours, possibly days of discharge time and uh, hundreds of megawatts to gigawatts of capacity. E among the large scale technologies, uh, we have uh, a new technology that is hydrogen storage. Then we have uh, a proven technology that is compressed air energy storage and a mature technology that is uh, pumped hydro. So why do we need uh, then large scale energy storage? We need, uh, we need it to uh, integrate uh, two important factors uh, in electricity production and consumption. So first of all, the renewable energy is an intermittent uh, uh, energy source. So it produces electricity when the wind blows and when sun shines. Then uh, the second is the variability of uh, the electricity demand. Here on the left uh, picture, we see the variability of uh, uh, electricity demand throughout the day with a peak uh, in the early hours of the morning, a secondary peak uh, at mid uh, late uh, afternoon, and then uh, the electricity demand uh, is uh, going down, uh, decreasing toward the night. So the combination of these two factors may give uh, at several hours of, uh, of the day or uh, several days uh, through the year, uh, a surplus of uh, electricity production. So this overgeneration then uh, must be stored and then must be reused uh, at uh, electricity peak demand. Unfortunately, the European Union doesn't have a very focused uh, strategy on energy storage. The Repower EU action plan that is due this month has the aim of cut the overdependence from fossil fuels from Russia and accelerate the energy transition. So it, uh, this plan will aim to, to accelerate the development of a hydrogen infrastructure and uh, storage, and this is very good, to increase the percentage of renewable energy by 2030. However, it will still put the emphasis on gas storage, and this may still keep some kind of dependence on foreign uh, gas imports. What would be really needed are uh, clear targets for energy storage by 2030, including a broader spectrum of uh, proven energy storage technologies. So batteries, compressed air energy storage, pumped hydro beside the hydrogen storage. Also, it will be important to have uh, implemented an effective uh, legislation that would uh, <coughs> remove any bottlenecks in, uh, in the permitting uh, procedure for the development of uh, energy storage. So hydrogen storage is a new technology 
and uh, it uses uh, of peak uh, uh, electricity from renewable energy to produce uh, hydrogen from electrolysis. Then uh, hydrogen is being compressed uh, and uh, stored in a subsurface structure. Uh, hydrogen can be retrieved when needed for uh, different applications uh, and it can be used for uh, electricity production. The hydrogen store storage has a round trip uh, efficiency between 30% and 60% according to the technology that is being used to produce electricity. And what is uh, very interesting for this type of uh, energy storage, uh, it has a very high energy density that is in the order of 490 kilowatt hour per cubic meter at 200 uh, atmosphere of pressure. Then we have the compressed air energy storage that is a proven technology. Off-peak electricity from renewable energy is being used to compress air and to inject it into a subsurface structure. Then air is expanded and conveyed to the turbines of the plant to produce electricity at electricity peak demand. We can now see one compressed air energy storage in operation. It is Hantorf in Germany. It is operational since 1978. It has a capacity of 320 megawatt by four hours storage. Uh, air is being compressed and stored in uh, two salt cavern for uh, a maximum uh, 310,000 uh, cubic meter of total volume. Uh, this plant uh, has been uh, designed and built originally to store uh, electricity surplus from a nearby uh, nuclear plant. Nowadays, Hantorf is uh, storing the surplus uh, electricity from uh, the wind farms in northern Germany. And now we can uh, um, see some differences and similarities between hydrogen storage and compressed air energy storage. The main similarity is that uh, they both use uh, subsurface structures for storage and they share a similar workflow for geological, geophysical and geomechanical characterization for, uh, for the design of the storage. Hydrogen storage use of peak renewable resource from both onshore and offshore. Uh, compressed air so far has been considered only for onshore renewable energy. Storage location for hydrogen onshore and offshore. And here I would like to recall the tractable uh, design concept for uh, offshore uh, hydrogen storage. And for compressed air, uh, only storage uh, location onshore so far. Variable efficiency for uh, uh, both uh, storages. Um, the upper end for compressed air energy storage is estimated at 70% and it will be relevant to the isothermal uh, compression of air process if, when, uh, will be achieved and realized. Uh, different energy density, as we can see, very high for hydrogen and 25 kilowatt hour per cubic meter at 200 atmosphere for the compressed air energy storage. Both storages can experience corrosion phenomena. In the pipeline could be quite severe for the hydrogen and also leakage risk. Of course, hydrogen is a kind of escapist gas among all the gas. And we can now draw some conclusions. So there is a real need for cost-effective uh, large-scale uh, energy storage uh, in order to have a continuous, even out and balanced uh, supply of uh, carbon neutral uh, energy. Subsurface structures uh, theoretically supply a potentially unlimited uh, storage. And uh, also, as we talk about uh, energy mix, uh, we may also talk about energy storage mix because uh, we may use uh, different technologies uh, for different industrial applications. And uh, finally, uh, there is already a wealth of expertise uh, for uh, the development of large scale energy storage. 
and uh, with the plenty of uh, transferable skills from the oil and gas industry. And with this, I want to conclude my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stefano. Um, so I'm going to leave the floor to Arnaud. Thank you, um, thank you, Aurélie. Thank you um, all for uh, attending this this conference tonight and uh, and staying with us uh, during our little break. Um, I will present you hydrogen uh, storage techniques for uh, for uh, storing hydrogen um, underground. Um, <clears throat> so hydrogen is part of um, hydrogen storage, sorry, is part of the net zero uh, energy infrastructure systems. I'm quite convinced that um, that uh, if hydrogen takes the place in our energy systems, mainly see today, storage uh, will be, a, and massive storage will be a key, um, a key need uh, to, 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 to do that. How can we do that? Uh, we've got three, uh, techniques uh, essentially for storing uh, large quantities of hydrogen underground. Um, the first one is salt caverns. Uh, second here is storage in depleted fields or aquifers, and the third one in is uh, mined caverns. Um, so just very briefly, uh, salt caverns. Uh, it's it's very nice because uh, salt has nice properties, it's tight and it's easy to uh, excavate. You inject water and you take out uh, brine. Um, aquifers and depleted fields, it's um, uh, the, the, the most uh, used for storing natural gas today. Uh, it's very close, uh, of course, to, uh, to the uh, ENP uh, world. And uh, mine caverns, so it's uh, mined in hard Rocks with mining techniques, um, and um, and it's uh, not tight by itself. It's um, it's uh, the product when it's in line. The product is stored by um, having a pressure of groundwater around it higher than the pressure in the cavern. So there are three techniques for storing uh, products underground. Um, why why should we go underground? It's there are other storage techniques. Um, we will. I'm quite convinced that we will go underground uh, if the storage need is high enough. Uh, it's what we've seen in other fostering other products like liquid and, and gaseous hydrocarbons. And uh, there are, of course, techniques for storing uh, hydrogen uh, in in surface tanks, uh, liquefied hydrogen in spheres. It it is done today. It, it does exist. Uh, but um, if we need to store uh, several thousand tons, um, it's very likely that underground storage will be uh, the most cost-effective way of doing it. So I will shortly go through the three, the three main techniques. Um, so first one is salt caverns. Um, pure hydrogen is stored in salt caverns since the 70s. The so 70s, it's all, only 10, 10 years or a decade after the first salt caverns were used for storing natural gas. So it nearly started at the same time. And there is also experience in town gas storage in salt caverns, uh, which did include a, a large part of, of hydrogen, 30 to 50%. Um, so there are some details um, below about the, these caverns. I cannot enter into this now. But the, my, my question is, is this experience uh, enough for uh, using now hydrogen caverns as, um, as, as a part of the new, uh, new uh, hydrogen uh, infrastructures? And, um, and well, we do see a lot of pilots, and Grégoire uh, will present one of them later on, and research developments today. So why, why and, and what are bringing all these uh, research uh, developments and pilots? So here I have um, several topics. Um, thermodynamic tools um, that are used to model how the gas cavern, the hydrogen cavern, 
behaves, uh, modeling its thermodynamics and also heat transfer with the salt rock around it. Uh, material selection, uh, because we, we know that uh, in steel we have unbrittleman questions. Tightness test, uh, because salt caverns are the very nice and quite unique uh, among these three techniques. Uh, proper, uh, uh, ability of being uh, tested, uh, the tightness can be tested very accu accurately. Salt permeability in rock salts. Uh, the reactivity of hydrogen in uh, when uh, when stored uh, uh, in uh, in a cavern due to uh, the microbiological activity there and the solubility. So I'm sorry I cannot really enter into these topics uh, for in 10 minutes, but there are details uh, in in the reference below about each of these topics, and they all got very recent over the last two or three years. They all uh, got a, a recent significant. Uh, uh, developments. <laughs> so what? Why? Um, so my understanding about that is that we've got several drivers for uh, for these developments. Um, on the top left, uh, we've got that the fact that hydrogen and natural gas are, in some ways, different animals. And the last uh, driver, I think, is that there is a massive uh, and very large uh, public funding um, behind these projects. And this is bringing um, a lot of uh, academic people that were not used to work on soil caverns to the topic. And sometimes they also bring their own research topics along them along with them. Um, <clears throat> so this was for salt caverns. Uh, yes, we still need more. Uh, we would like standards for well equipment uh, for hydrogen caverns. And we would like to see more feedback from operation of hydrogen caverns. Porous media. So this is a second um, kind uh, type of underground storage. Um, there is no experience to date of uh, storing pure hydrogen in porous media. But there is experience of storing blends of hydrogen and other gases in aquifers and depleted fields. So this is a list of um, oh, yeah, this is a list of the town gas uh, experience. Um, it, uh, it, also, it includes again a, a large portion of hydrogen uh, in, in depleted fields and aquifers mostly uh, in uh, Germany and uh, also in, uh, in France or Czech Republic. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so this is uh, until the mid-20th mid, mid, uh, mid 20th century. There are also recent storage pilots. Um, the most visible probably today in, in depleted field, in a small uh, isolated depleted field, is uh, led by uh, RAG. It is a sun storage project that injected up to 10% hydrogen uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Another project is also, uh, has also been done in Argentina, the Hichico project, also a blend. Uh, <clears throat> so, even so, there is no pure hydrogen storage in depleted fuel aquifer to date. There is no obvious showstopper, no, no obvious technical showstoppers. Uh, but there are technical developments uh, that are currently done today. Uh, for instance, on the physical behavior in the reservoir, on the chemical and biochemical reactions, uh, on the uh, caprock uh, integrity, and, and it is the same for all techniques on, uh, on steel and elastomers compatibility with hydrogen. Um, I will briefly go, so these, I, as said, there are technical developments. Um, it's very active today. Um, one of the projects, of the land project that is active on these topics today is a high stories project um, that I coordinate 
So I will briefly go through what is done to give you an idea of the developments that are are um, are being done and and will be brought uh, over the the next few months or years. Um, so this project is focused on two big parts. One is subsurface technology developments, and this is focused on porous media. So first, um, a first work package is led uh, by CO2 Geonet and it gathers 17 geological surveys throughout Europe. It, it um, aims at building a GIS of uh, potential locations for uh, porous media storage in, at the European scale. And the challenge here is to work at the European scale for that. Uh, second work package um, is on uh, is on, on reservoir engineering, and is on capacity estimates. There are some in this industry. There are some uh, um, mitigated uh, past experience of capacity estimates on uh, shale gas, for instance, or CCS, um, based on only geological views. So here we bring in some reservoir engineering to try to have some and to there is some more reliable capacity estimates uh, of on these uh, porous uh, media traps a third topic um, also uh, very uh, very active today is uh, the microbiological uh, activity in the reservoirs here again uh, we had a challenge um, it is very site specific and we are not looking at one specific site so we uh, gathered uh, a lot of uh, operators of natural gas storages in aquifers or depleted field in the project and uh, they will bring us samples of their brines their rocks um, not in the idea of studying their sites and, and their the conversion of their site to hydrogen but on the idea that, that this site could have been in other in another world selected for uh, hydrogen storage so the idea is to gather this uh, large um, large um, number of samples and to have an idea of what could, can be found uh, for future projects in europe based on these quite representative samples and uh, last um, topic is on uh, material and steel uh, material uh, qualification for hydrogen service so this is for technology developments. Uh, there is another part of the project uh, that is uh, dedicated to uh, techno-economic feasibility studies. Um, I will not go through it uh, right now because um, I think I will go over time, but I would be happy if you if you want to contact me. Um, <clears throat> third topic is mine caverns, uh, third, third technology. Mine caverns um, are a good alternative for uh, intermediate capacities, um, especially when uh, the rock uh, is is good enough uh, for mine caverns, for mining cavern, and when there is no salt and no uh, porous media. Um, the industrial standard today is uh, for mine cavern storage is unlined mine caverns. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it's good and it's okay for low pressure storage below 10 bar, uh, because as said in, in the introduction, uh, the confinement pr principle is this uh, hydrodynamic confinement. So the pressure must be below the groundwater pressure around the cavern, and you cannot go too deep to excavate in using mining works. <coughs> So it's okay for, uh, let's say, pressure uh, below 10 bar, uh, which is quite low when you, you store a gas, you would have very low uh, densities of storage. So we are looking also at storing at higher pressures, up to 250 bars. There is uh, one experience in, in uh, Sweden, in Skallen. It was managed by, uh, by Storengi at the time. Uh, for storing uh, natural gas in a line mine cavern and we are looking at this as a credible option for storing uh, for storing hydrogen uh, tomorrow um, the principle is of the liner uh, uh, would be uh, would be this one uh, you would have a steel liner a sliding liner right below uh, a con con concrete with reinforcements a short crate at the surface of the rock drainage pipe and uh, and also the the rock uh, the rock mass must be competent enough to uh, to to 
<laughs> to host uh, this cavern. So here, a lot of these topics are uh, underlined. There are technology developments uh, we are working on on, this, on these topics. Um, to conclude, this is my last slide. Um, underground storage techniques are providing three technologies for uh, hydrogen storage. One is mature, uh, it is all caverns. One is nearly mature, it, it, is, it has never been done to date, but there is no obvious showstopper, and there are a lot of, of efforts today to, to go through the last uh, technology development step, steps um, that, uh, that we, uh, we face. And the third one uh, is uh, mine rock caverns, lined mine rock caverns, uh, which is very promising uh, for a lot of a lot of uh, locations that cannot have, for for instance, salt caverns. And uh, and it is seen as well as a, a very credible option for for hosting uh, hydrogen storage. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arnaud. Uh, now we will go to Grégoire's presentation. Uh, okay. Thank you, Aurélie. Uh, so, um, for this last presentation, I, I will speak a little more about uh, uh, salt cavern, especially. So, uh, not aquifer, no depleted field, not even uh, line work, carried, but, uh, but salt cavern. I don't know if this technology is well known. Um, and to be simple, these cavern are artificial cavern uh, because the salt have two qualities, as uh, Arno said. It is uh, soluble in water and it is tight, uh, naturally very tight. So the solubility is interesting for creating the cavern by the leaching method, as you can see. Uh, we organize a system of uh, brine, uh, water injection and brine with the wall uh, to, to create this big, big cavern, potentially very big. Uh, I don't know if you can see me, but I bring with me some um, small scale model. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know because the camera is, I don't know where it is, but uh, uh, this cavern uh, uh, could be uh, very large uh, until 500 to 600 uh, thousand, thousand cubic meter. You can show to the audience here if you want. Yeah, uh, just an example here uh, for the audience with the uh, uh, Arc de Triomphe, uh, at the same scale to, to have an idea of the, of the side of, of such a cavern. It could take, uh, it could take uh, years to create such a cavern, uh, so it's uh, um, yeah specific uh, activity. Uh, and we work uh, generally with um, chemical industry uh, to, to use the brine and to extract the salt from the uh, use the salt extract from the from the cavern before the gas filling and uh, gas operation uh, as you can see uh, on this slide so to give an example in france uh, we have uh, three sites uh, of uh, storage in salt cavern uh, in the southeast of France, uh, Autrive and Tersan are the same site, in fact, uh, uh, they are uh, very closed. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's given an idea of the storage uh, in France. Uh, okay. uh, so for the hydrogen in salt cavern, um, today's storage is involved in, uh, in the uh, pilot, but as uh, Arnaud said uh, before, they are we identify four sites of hydrogen storage uh, existing today. Uh, so it's not totally new. Uh, the, the oldest site uh, is, is yeah, in operation for more than 40 years, nearly 15, we can, we, 50, we can say. So it's, it's not really new. Um, 
but um, we have not a lot of uh, return of experiment from these uh, different caverns today. This cavern was used for um, uh, hydrocarbon refinery, and so it's uh, very special uh, used uh, in comparison with uh, with the, the use of hydrogen for energy. And uh, this is a map from a, a study um, in 2018 uh, of the potential of uh, hydrogen storage development in some country in Europe. Uh, of course, it is where there, there, there is salt, rock salt, uh, and uh, there, there is different possibility in Germany, north of Germany, with the the Zechstein deposit, it's a very, very long, large uh, salt deposit, and a little in France, in Spain, and UK, as you can see, in Romania too. Um, so today I am involved uh, personally, but uh, the Storengy is involved in a, a big project called Ipster. Ipster is the first supported large scale green hydrogen storage demonstrator in the site of Etre in the southeast of France. So, uh, IPSTER stands for uh, Hydrogen Pilot Storage for Large Ecosystem Replication. Uh, the, the project started in 2021 and for three years. Uh, and you have some detail uh, of the project. We have, um, it include, uh, includes um, hydrogen production by an electrolysis, uh, one megawatt uh, PEM electroly electrolyzer, and uh, the pilot in a small cavern, uh, and we, we will store small quantity for the, this first step, uh, about three ton of hydrogen to in an experimental phases and to, yeah, for a cavern, uh, with the, a potential of 44 tons of uh, working gas, uh, working hydrogen volume. Uh, we have uh, a lot of partners in this project uh, in Germany, uh, in, uh, Great Britain, and Norway today. Yeah, just to, to give an idea, as the idea, uh, it's the, 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 principle is to produce hydrogen by electrolysis to, in, to inject hydrogen in the cavern to make some tests with uh, cycles and to reuse the hydrogen. Uh, the experimental cavern uh, you can see uh, is very close to the uh, natural gas uh, central station in blue and uh, so in red you have the, the platform of the is a 53 soul cavern, which is our experimental cavern. It is a very small cavern, and uh, you can see in yellow the H2 production platform, with the, where will be the electrolyzer. The, for the planning, the work started in June 2022 for the two platform. Uh, and for the storage, we we plan to set a special completion in the well in end of 2022, maybe early 2023, to to inject the first cubic meter uh, of hydrogen uh, in the spring 2023. So uh, just some key figures. Uh, you have on the left our experimental cavern. It's a very teeny cavern, uh, not really a cavern. In fact, there's something very, very small. Uh, you have also the depths. Uh, but uh, this is a, a good occasion to, to, to have a pilot in this small cavern. Uh, in comparison, a typical cavern uh, uh, for natural gas uh, could uh, um, reach the uh, uh, working gas volume of about uh, uh, 70,000 uh, million uh, of, of uh, cubic meter, normal cubic meter. So, 
Yeah, uh, on the uh, little size uh, uh, model, I have also another size, but it's, it's difficult without the camera, but uh, uh, you can see the, you. The, the depth, <laughs> one millimeter for one meter, uh, and so it's oh, the idea of the, of the cavern. Okay, so yeah, there is a camera, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you can see it, and on the surface, you have the, you have the village uh, at the same scale, of course. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it is the, the idea of the, of the of the slide with the, the two caverns, um, and the one for today, the, the, the natural gas cavern are all in the deepest layer, about uh, 1,300 meter in depth, and uh, the experimental cavern is on in, in the upper layer of salt uh, at about uh, eight to 900 meter. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, but if you have a question, I'm ready for uh, all the questions and the discussion. Thank you very much, Grégoire, and thank you to Stefano and Arnaud as well. So now, now we'll go to the questions. So I will leave the floor to Alice and Laura on my left, but for the people online and people in the room, just uh, like for the people in the room, raise your hand. And for the people online, you can uh, just type your question in the chat. And if needed, we'll uh, switch on your micro and you will be able um, to ask your question out loud. Um, so please, Alice and Laura. OK, I'm trying to think of a good one to start. Um, I have quite specific questions for each presenter. I'm not sure about you. No, yeah. This one. yeah. Um, um, so one for Stefano. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me. That's yeah. probably better. Um, forgive me because I am not an engineer. I am a petrophysicist okay. um, with some offshore experience. But um, with regards to the energy density of hydrogen, um, is I mean, I'm, I understand that um, having the storage sites and the production sites close together to mitigate any energy loss during transport is is probably a, a, as good of an idea as is feasible for these projects. Um, but in terms of the energy loss, is there any way to quantify that? So energy loss will be... Uh, more relevant to efficiency of the energy storage yes. rather than energy density. So, yeah, we are talking about uh, um, different uh, efficiency for uh, any hydrogen storage. And uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, is uh, um, due to the mostly due to the, the process that you used to produce a electricity from uh, from hydrogen. There are uh, three common uh, uh, technologies to produce uh, electricity from hydrogen. One is uh, from the gas turbine, where you use uh, combusted uh, uh, hydrogen. And this is uh, the, low, the lowest efficiency, around 30%. Then there is uh, the fuel cells, that is uh, around 50%. And then there is also the combined cycle, uh, large scale plant that would use um, combusted hydrogen uh, in the gas turbine. It will recover uh, the heat to produce a steam that uh, will be used then in the steam turbine. So that will be uh, the 60% efficiency for, for uh, retrieving hydrogen Retrieving electricity from hydrogen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I have a question as well for Stefano. So, as you uh, painted the picture of about the European legislation, so we have the Renewable Energy Directive, the Climate Change Act in uh, in the UK, the Net Zero. So, one of the things you said that you know the current uh, actually the European legislation, it's not. Um, specifically dedicated to uh, hydrogen storage. So maybe your idea how 
how we could actually change it because another thing as well maybe the current legislation actually doesn't have any like binding targets for let's say specifically for uh, France you know how to for example achieve all these targets so what's your opinion of what maybe needs to change in terms of the European legislation yeah so the idea is to have a kind of a homegrown uh, renewable energy development uh, in, uh, in the Euro European Union. And so uh, to, to have this, I would uh, consider more uh, uh, these new technologies or proven technologies for energy storage. Okay, hydrogen storage is being considered in the, in the action plan, um, but also compressed air energy storage or uh, more pumped hydro and this because uh, really this would uh, enhance uh, the development of uh, homegrown uh, renewable energy i mean uh, fully european union uh, development on uh, renewable energy um, an independent uh, energy transition an independent net zero without uh, the interference of uh, um, gas import from outside the, the union Are there any other plants in Europe similar to this, or maybe there's some in the development phase? Uh, so um, there are uh, uh, currently three companies that are trying to develop uh, compressed air uh, energy storage. And one uh, is uh, Store Electric in UK, and uh, they are trying to develop a 40 megawatt compressed air energy storage in the Cheshire Salt. And uh, so I think this is uh, uh, one big reality in, in Europe. Um, Arnaud maybe can uh, uh, add more on other uh, uh, operators. Um, on compressed air energy storage, uh, besides from what I know, uh, I first it's, it's not always easy to know what is just a website and what is a financed project that will go ahead. So if I only focus on the last uh, category, um, and I, I don't even know whether it's fully financed and maybe not, but but yes, there's Store Electric, uh, Core Energy is also uh, 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 driving a project in the Netherlands. And uh, these people from Core Energy, by the way, are former people from Guy Electric. Uh, and 10 years ago, it was a big project in our sort of cavern industries. They had a, a project of KS uh, in Northern Ireland, but uh, Guy Electric uh, went bankrupt. Um, we have also a Canadian company called uh, Hydrostore that is um, promoting KS. And uh, yeah, and also then there is also a Chinese project. I, there, there is not a lot of, of info. I'm, I'm not sure in which category it is. And so there is also another one uh, in, uh, in California. <clears throat> this is called the Energy Internet Corporation that uh, is more interested actually in uh, developing uh, compressed air energy storage in depleted gas uh, reservoir. And um, they are trying to develop the isothermal uh, principle of uh, uh, air compression and expansion that uh, hopefully will give uh, a higher efficiency with respect uh, of uh, the efficiency that we saw in Huntorf. Huntorf has uh, around 40% of efficiency. It is, it is possible that uh, the isothermal uh, compression uh, of air would reach 70% uh, of efficiency. And uh, yeah, um, beside that, uh, of course, we know Huntorf and Macintosh is another compressed air energy storage in Salt Cavern. But there is, uh, in California, there has been a pilot of uh, compressed air energy storage using a depleted gas reservoir. So there is also a pilot using porous media. Okay, thank you. And my next question will be to Arno. 
Um, so I would like to actually challenge you a little bit. So you said there's no uh, show stoppers for the hydrogen storage in the depleted reservoirs and aquifers. So one of, one of the things that I could think of is, for example, if we use the hydrogen in the depleted reservoir, there would be a lot of contamination. So for example, if we would want to use the hydrogen afterwards for a fuel cell car, it might be a problem that the purity of the hydrogen uh, wouldn't be the, obviously sufficient for, uh, that's one of the examples. And second example, obviously hydrogen is the smallest molecule in the periodic table and it tends to escape. So what's, what's, your, your, what's your opinion about this? Um, so thank you. <laughs> I don't know whether should I say that. So your first question um, is, uh, is about purity or gas quality when we storing hydrogen. For is that only from from depleted fields or from depleted fields and aquifers? I think it applies to both because in aquifers you also have the same issue. Obviously, for the depleted as a red oil and gas reservoirs, it's you have more contamination, but you also have it in aquifers. So, um, uh, so this is true. This is one of the of the topic that is uh, looked at by by us uh, and by a lot of people today uh, in in porous media. Um, why more than in salt caverns? Uh, it's because it relates to the microbiological activity we have underground, and uh, porous media are more prone to these activities than salt caverns for two reasons uh, because there are more families of of, um, of uh, bacteria and archaea that can develop in less saline brines than in uh, than is an insaturated brines and also uh, because you, your your surface of contact between i mean bacteria will live in the in the in the aqueous phase and near the interface with the gas phase and uh, this surface is much higher in porous media you can find that in each pore uh, when compared to a, a salt cavern, uh, so you you um, you have um, yes, there there is uh, there are two families of of bacteria that are uh, looked at uh, essentially um, sulfate reducing bacteria that can use sulfates that can come from an hydride from many minerals, and 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 dissolve hydrogen to produce H2S, and the other. Um, a family is is uh, methanogen uh, ones that would use uh, carbonates and dissolve uh, CO3 and and dissolve hydrogen to produce uh, methane. So yes, this is um, this is uh, looked at uh, especially for porous media. Uh, also, we have to know that there are uh, treatment options at the at, uh, when withdrawing. And there are uh, a pressure swing adsorption. Uh, it does exist. Um, then, um, yeah, it has to be assessed. And and we are, I mean, you you saw it's one of the focus of of um, of the of the project, of the high stories project I discussed. So now your second question um, about the size of, of so you 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 st you said that a hydrogen uh, molecule uh, is uh, the smallest uh, in the periodic uh, table, but the periodic table is about atoms. And not really molecules. So your molecule is dehydrogen, and dehydrogen is only uh, is seventy percent of a methane molecule. So if you look at molecules, the gas molecule, this it's not the difference is not that big. But then anyhow, uh, it I'm not sure it really matters, um, and uh, this is something I'm I'm often surprised. Uh, people often often come with this. With this idea, and, uh, and and if you look at the transport mechanisms that do happen in the ground, it the size of the molecule does not really play a role. If you consider salt caverns, for instance, you've got three mechanisms. You've got uh, permeation. Permeation, it's when um, uh, um, when it goes through a, a crystal, it what happen in, happens in, in steel. It what happens in in polymers like your your uh, balloon like its balloon when it uh, it's it's what it's why they <laughs> yeah they, they deflate <laughs> I don't know the English word uh, so it's um it's it's when you tire you have to re uh, re increase the pressure of your tires so it goes into a slit 
and this uh, it it should not happen uh, for which uh, which like halides um, and uh, and uh, and it's and also it's not the molecule it's uh, the atom itself like the proton of your hydrogen and the proton cannot enter an ionic crystal and so there's no real uh, permeation uh, then you've got uh, your uh, dissolved hydrogen in in brine or in 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 your uh, water that is saturated your rocks and where well, there is diffusion, uh, it's thick laws, and it's it's not that uh, significant. And then uh, you've got Darcy's law, and uh, well, I mean the, the the size of the molecule is not really at play. You've got the viscosity, yes, but and hydrogen is more viscous, but it's not really a question of of molecule size in single phase flow. Thank you. So maybe if I can add yes. about your question, so and for the porous uh, the storage in porous reservoir, so the integrity is take take over by the, the cap rocks, and effectively it's not a question of the molecule size; it's a question of a, a interfacial tension, uh, comparing to the cap rock uh, capillary entry pressure. So it's exactly the same story comparing to natural gas. So no particular issue related to molecule size. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that I'm sure there's lots of questions online and from the floor also, but I've just got one for Greg Gregoire. Um, so you showed us your large salt cavern. Um, how have you modelled the maximum size a cavern can be to maintain overburden integrity for the village, for example? You know, if, if I'm living there, yeah. how do I know that that's not going to cause problems? Is there a modeling process and a maximum size, depending on the cap rock, I suppose? In fact, the, the maximum size of the cavern depends largely of the of the salt deposit and the and the characteristic of the salt deposit. Uh, um, and so um, it is uh, well to 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 leach uh, to dig this sort of cavern. We but a lot of uh, mechanical study to be sure that the, the caverns are stable. Uh, if you you have uh, an idea of the depth with the length of my, yeah, well, on my model, uh, <laughs> they are very deep. Uh, and so uh, it's safer to have uh, um, gas in a deep cavern because uh, in the depths, you have no oxygen, and so you have no risk of um, contact with uh, the, the oxygen and the gas, a mix of oxygen and gas. So uh, if I take my cavern and this, this model and I put it in the middle of the village to say that I will store the same thing with 200 bar uh, on surface, you imagine the, 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 the size of the, the building. It's, uh, it's Of course, it's huge. So. Myself, I prefer this gas is uh, more than one met one one thousand meter in depth, uh, far from oxygen and far from from uh, human activity. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, the safest way to store uh, gas uh, to store underground, not only in store in, in in salt cavern, but underground. Uh, for a large cavern, it's not only a question of, of cost, uh, as uh, uh, as it was shown, uh, but also a question of uh, of safety, uh, I think. And um, yeah, so after that, of course, we ha we have to be sure that everything is stable, and it is uh, the um, topic of a lot of mechanical studies. Uh, to design correctly the cavern with a, a correct shape and uh, with uh, with um, also um, safe distance from the top of the salt, from the distance between cavern, uh, all, all these uh, design aspect. Uh, I think the the most mm, the, the larger cavern I, I heard was about three uh, mil, uh, million. Cubic. Yeah, three million cubic meter, but. It is not all in gas. A part is in gas and a part stay in brine. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can uh, leach very, very big cavern. In France, the biggest are about uh, five to six hundred thousand cubic meter. But uh, in United States, 
uh, we heard about one million, two million cubic meters. There is no real limit. I know where the biggest cancer research ever, ever developed in the world. Right? The biggest cancer is developed by Dow Chemical in um, about 100 to 200 kilometers west of Houston, and it is 72 million bowels cavern, which is about 12 million cubic meters. And though in north of Germany, bears caverns of more than four or even five million cubic meters, but not for gas storage. Sorry, the stability issues are just not the same. If I can add a little bit also, um, also the pressure of operation of the storage will be important uh, because, uh, of course, uh, um, you you need to store uh, your uh, um, hydrogen or uh, compressed air, for example, at the pressure that would not, uh, would not fracture the overburden and then uh, create leakage. And... Uh, there is uh, in the design of uh, storage, underground storage, uh, there is plenty of uh, GNG studies and 3D modeling to, to model and assess also the pressure of operations that also are a cyclical kind of uh, um, uh, variability. There is a cyclical variability of the uh, operation pressures. Yeah, you need a you need a maximum pressure, and you need also a minimum pressure, yes. yeah, to to be sure that everything is stable. So you yeah. let in the cavern a uh, large quantity of gas. We we were speaking of cushion gas. It could be uh, from thirty to even fifty percent of the tot uh, of the total uh, gas uh, capacity, and you use the other part as a working gas volume between the minimum and maximum pressure. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, we spoke a lot about hydrogen storage, but uh, I think one thing we obviously have to mention as well, how hydrogen is produced. So there's obviously several ways how you can produce hydrogen. One of them is uh, steam uh, methane reforming, which is uh, obviously not, uh, most of the times, it's not a renewable process. Uh, of course, we can uh, capture the CO2. And another option is uh, throughout the hydrolysis, which was mentioned during the presentation, but unfortunately it's expensive. It also requires energy to actually perform the electrolysis. So my question to experts today is how we can uh, solve this challenge. What should we do in your opinion? Okay, so some projections that we have Current state is that uh, blue hydrogen is less expensive than uh, green hydrogen nowadays. I think there are some figures of uh, uh, $2.5 per kilogram of uh, blue hydrogen and $7.5 per kilogram for green hydrogen. Um, some studies that are currently being done in Scotland, because now Scotland has a, a huge, uh, is starting with a huge offshore wind de development. So some studies that uh, we have in Scotland would show that uh, still in 2030, green, hydro green hydrogen will be still more expensive than uh, blue hydrogen. But uh, going toward 2050, actually green hydrogen um, will be less expensive than uh, blue hydrogen. And then this, of course, uh, will be related to several factors. The, the huge uh, power that is going to be installed offshore in terms of uh, offshore wind, the possibility of uh, uh, processing and producing hydrogen offshore, and uh, and also the decrease that we see already today, the decrease in cost of electrolyzers. So green hydrogen and the efficiency, more efficiency in, uh, in the electrolysis. So yeah, green hydrogen uh, is set to be cheaper than uh, in the long run. I, 
I, I could add, add a point. The, the idea is not only to use hydrogen and to produce hydrogen, but also to store electricity. Uh, it is it is a, a, a really a challenge because uh, it's difficult to store electricity. Uh, we can store in battery for for a short time, but for a long time and for massive storage, uh, we have probably no uh, choice about the, this idea of hydrogen. So, of course, um, grey or blue hydrogen are, today are, are cheaper, uh, but it's not only a question to to introduce a new energy is uh, the introduction of, of um, the, a way to store electricity. And it's particularly true for a country like Germany, uh, Poland, Denmark, where they develop a lot of renewables. And when you have some time energy that you don't know what to do because there is no consumption, and so you really need to store it. And so it's it's not with blue hydrogen that you can store an, uh, electricity. It's, uh, it's um, yeah, it's a question uh, how to to use this energy not to lose this uh, energy of renewable sometime and yeah to adapt to the thing so of course there is a today a competition and when i, I spoke with clients of hydrogen they say oh gray hydrogen is really cheaper today so i i, I, I will wait uh, but uh, but the idea is could be also a way to store electricity and to to go ahead with this uh, transition energetic transition Okay, thank you. And um, another question uh, that I have is that, um, so as an investor, so I have uh, three options that uh, we talked about. I can uh, invest my money to to develop a salt current project, but it obviously is uh, it, the, the sites that are available, it's sometimes a very specific location. Uh, the same actually with aquifers, that's a, something I guess more new, uh, a more new project, and the same with the uh, depleted reservoirs. That is also still undeveloped uh, technology. And the last one was the mined uh, caverns. So, where do you see the development of the large-scale hydrogen uh, technology going? And what what advice would you give me as an investor? I can take this one or start at least. <laughs> Advice and as, as an investor, um, it's um, you have to, to make up your, your business plan and it's, it's, I mean, historically networks are, have not really started at a, like very huge scale. So your first opportunities may be local ones and locally you may not have your three choices. So I would say that uh, work on your business plan. This is what we need our industry today um, the most, I think. Uh, um, I mean, project developers, and uh, uh, that are that are bringing opportunities uh, for uh, for underground hydrogen storage. And um, then, yes, uh, if you if you would have the choice, um, may, maybe today salt caverns are appealing because they enable high flow rates uh, because <clears throat> because it's uh, mature, etc. Um, but I mean, there are many other reasons to develop underground storage. Uh, there, there is like also we see that with uh, natural gas today, uh, strategic uh, geopolitical reasons. So large countries like Italy that have no salt for developing salt caverns. They may also want uh, underground storage at some point. So, yeah, it, it would be case specific, I think, and uh, that's what I think. And uh, investors are very good at uh, make or break uh, things. And uh, regarding energy storage, there is a, a kind of a very base case that is uh, Energy storage is storing a commodity that is a cheap commodity, electricity. So um, you need to develop energy storage that uh, releases electricity uh, that is uh, at the same price or competitive price, uh, at the same price of, uh, re with respect to the original, uh, the primary energy source. So, yeah, you cannot uh, convince an investor showing um, that you want to build a, 
uh, and energy storage that uh, the price uh, per kilowatt hour is uh, skyrocketing uh, compared with the solar or uh, wind. So they should be in the same kind of range. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have an idea of the potential uh, uh, of sol salt cavern development in France? I'm just unsure uh, about um, what is the real capability of our country to fast develop new caverns. Uh, and uh, also, I just cannot find uh, any uh, documentation on internet about uh, the subject, uh, when it is possible, it's easy to find when talking about when uh, uh, it comes from Germany, uh, the Netherlands, the UK or Spain, you can find uh, articles, but not in France. So I'm just, I feel concerned because, um, because um, I, uh, brine uh, output is difficult to get rid of and also in some other parts of France uh, for uh, environmental reasons, it is difficult to develop new caverns. And I would like to know what you think about this. Thank you, Jean-Paul, for your question. So, potential, uh, I think there are different understanding behind potential of uh, development of soil caverns. One of them is um, is the um, I mean economic potential, and I think it is what is limiting us today in, uh, in this uh, hydrogen storage um, development, and um, where well, it's 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 um, one way of of looking at that is to see that today in in uh, globally we've got 10 percent of the natural gas production and annual production that is stored uh, in storage capacity that can be stored. In Europe, I think it's 20% of the annual uh, consumption of Europe that is stored. If you are a little bit conservative and say, let's say that 5% of the future European hydrogen production will be stored on the ground, it leads you to, uh, to 20 to 40 salt caverns in France alone. So if you store 5% of the French uh, hydrogen uh, I mean, a production or, or consumption, assuming it's national, by 3050, it will be 20, that is projected by 2050, it will be 20 to 40 caverns. If you, um, but when you said potential, I think you, you thought about technical potential, right? Um, it's a combination. Uh, it's a technical potential. You have, um, you have uh, environmental potential, economic potential, but at the end, um, okay, I know you need uh, soil formation, you need water, you have to get rid of the brine, and I'm just not too sure today how you will manage to develop new caverns. Fast. <laughs> Um, there is experience in developing caverns even recently, as you know. I mean, it's it's been done in Manosque uh, less than ten years ago, and uh, so I think I think it's 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 ho hopefully, uh, and of course, uh, still doable in France. Uh, the technical potential, uh, if you if you um, some people, some academic people, uh, there is a study by Caglayan et al. Um, from GFZ that have looked at salt deposits and um, they made kind of reasonable assumptions and they put uh, they did put um, uh, salt caverns everywhere on salt deposits. So they give you um, like a upper boundary of what's doable in terms of salt caverns and they're way way higher of what uh, what uh, market could demand. So I don't see. Um, I don't see a, a technical uh, obvious uh, limitation for developing soil caverns in France. I see an econ economic opportunity for maybe uh, 20 to 40 uh, caverns should the hydrogen economy developed as planned. And, um, 
and um, where you also uh, talk about acceptability, uh, disposal of brine, etc. Uh, as you know, this this is, I think, a case to case uh, uh, question. Um, and here, I mean, our strongest argument is that we we've been developing salt caverns even recently in France. So um, I think it could continue. Uh, if if I could add something, uh, the, the question of fast, uh, as you say, uh, is a real question. Uh, the storage of hydrogen is uh, only one brick of this global chain of hydrogen. Uh, we will have to produce hydrogen, we will have to use hydrogen, and we have to develop all these aspects and storage also. And uh, today it's difficult to, to know uh, how it will be fast <laughs> to develop the production and the, and the usage. Uh, and we have to adapt the, the need of storage of this production. Of course, to develop a cavern is relatively long. Uh, it's a question of year, as I said, uh, not of weeks. <laughs> uh, and so to, to have a new project, it will take year and probably uh, um, yeah, dozens of years, uh, but it's probably uh, we have probably to follow the rhythm of, of the development of the global chain of, of hydrogen. And I have no uh, good element to say that we will need this storage faster or not faster from, from this global chain. Uh, after that, uh, we have to include that to develop a cavern. It's question of years, of course. If I may, I'd like to add, to add some figures, maybe. If you look at the last figures from, from uh, you can find the European um, Internet, you know, regarding the development and the usage of H2. You know, I don't know, through three, three weeks ago, they mentioned, OK, in Europe, we may need to produce 20 million tons of H2 a year. 20 million tons, it's a massive. Uh, volumes. Of course, it's figures. And the first question we need to ask is who is going and where are we going to produce this H2? So the first question is, OK, let's take these figures, 20 million ton. I'm pretty sure that the, the production of, the, of this H2 will not be produced in Europe. So we may rely on, OK, green H2 coming from uh, France, maybe uh, blue H2 coming from uh, CH4, but maybe from import as well. And when you look at, you know, the, the, the other partner on the world, there is, a, there, is a, there is something that is missing is as first business model by customers and infrastructures. When you look at the countries that may build and, and produce a green H2, because we're talking about green H2, you need what? Wind, sun, yeah? So sun is mainly uh, Spain, south of Europe, all that kind of stuff. But today, I don't see any uh, proper proof that they are building infrastructure to produce such H2. Okay, but anyway, let's take the, figure, the figures uh, provided by the European Union, 20 million tons. When you look at these figures, in 2030, it means we may need to... Oh, I take the figures, huh? sorry. I have no, a figure. No, I can hear you, 20 million. Okay. So, so 20 million tons, according to our, our calculation, the storage calculation, if you take, we may need to store 10%, we say 10%, which is quite low, in fact, huh, of H2 in Europe, we consider we may need to create 120 caverns by 2030. 120 caverns, which is a huge number. Okay. Okay. It is, means that... Is, it, is this for Europe or is this for Europe, 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 Europe. Europe, Europe which is a huge number. But in order to start to build it, you need to have the other bricks, you know, to the other chains. And today we are still looking forward, to be honest, to the other uh, chains, you know, uh, which is uh, infrastructure, transmissions, production, and customers. And to be honest, this is only my feeling here, it's my personal feeling, if we don't have any European subsidies mm -hmm. to start to push the process, I don't know who will dare to to start the process. Storage is starting by uh, uh, hipsters, but when, when you look at the other country, are they investing in uh, oh, yes. H2 storages? Oh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, really? In, in the Netherlands mm. and in Germany, yes. Maybe. 
but yeah. uh, well, but when I listen, when I listen to the high deal Espana, uh, the manager says, well, but if you look at 2050, well, from what we estimate, uh, the, the the amount of uh, of hydrogen that could be produced and required to be stored is not 20 million, but it is 280 million tons. This is not 2030, this is 2050. And if you look at um, hydrogen in Europe, it is a quite uh, significant research organizing. They say, well, it is not 280 million, it is 700 million metric tons of hydrogen. You should consider for st uh, maybe not, maybe 5% or maybe 20% for storage, but it is maybe out of the, our understanding today. But if we go to hydrogen, maybe the figures are even higher than what is uh, discussed today. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is numbers uh, debate is uh, is funny. It uh, reminds us a presidential election, <laughs> except <laughs> that we I think we agree, and uh, we uh, we agree. And uh, I mean I agree with the uh, Strange's numbers and projections. And what what's for sure and and with the vision that uh, what's for sure is that should I mean if the infrastructure will develop, if the use will develop, storage will be needed. There, there are a lot of drivers that that require uh, storage to happen in underground storage because it's the safest and cheapest way of storing massive quantities of hydrogen. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I need to squeeze some online questions <laughs> to be fair with the people online. <laughs> um, so I have a question for Stefano. Um, I saw on one of your slides that you are facing to corrosion on tubing casing uh, and on line pipe. What materials are you using and do you intend to check possibility to use fiberglass composite solution? And that's from Bruno Guillemin. Yeah, so the information that we have for uh, um, compressed air energy storage uh, corrosion <coughs> comes from Hantorf and uh, the presence of uh, oxygen, oxygen and brine uh, caused <coughs> uh, corrosion at the tubing. So the tubing at the steel uh, that was a steel originally, so it has been replaced with uh, uh, some fiber uh, reinforced uh, uh, tubing and uh, this has been also re uh, replaced a second time, but uh, definitely uh, still must be avoided for compressed air energy storage. And uh, a big challenge in terms of uh, hydrogen infrastructure is uh, the, the, the thing, uh, if now we shift to hydrogen storage, is the fact that uh, hydrogen induces brittleness uh, in the steel uh, pipeline. So, if uh, we want to have uh, uh, hydrogen as a capillary spread as uh, the gas network, we may have to think maybe to polyurethane kind of uh, 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 pipeline or some kind of uh, uh, polymer-based uh, uh, material rather than uh, steel pipeline. Thank you, Stefano. Um, so next question is for Arno. What is your thoughts on the Ardent Abergeldi vertical shaft as an alternative to lined rock cavern? And that's from Vincent Bornman. Um, I'm not sure to know uh, Ardent Abergeldi. <laughs> um, I know there are some um, companies that are promoting uh, vertical shafts, line shafts. And um, yes, it is uh, it is uh, very close to uh, to line uh, rock caverns. We've looked uh, at that actually for compressed air uh, energy storage a few years ago, uh, ten years ago, uh, on some concept of uh, lined shafts. So it's um, I would say it's um, it is it is very close to uh, line rock caverns. Um, yeah. Sorry. Is, 
possible a way. Uh, yeah, yes, um, it's a, but it's um, when it's lined, the, the 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 necessity to be deep enough for a for a high, for a hydrostatic uh, containment, hydrodynamic containment, is not there anymore because you've got the liner that is here for the tightness. So um, yes, I know there are people and Australian companies pushing uh, um, lined uh, uh, lined shafts, and um, it's it's an option. Um, I'm not really sure about uh, what is uh, most economical. And when you go to the surface, you've got also like uh, unconsolidated uh, sediments that are not providing any mechanical support at all. So you've got other issues you have to deal with. And um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, next question is for Arnaud and Grégoire. So as mentioned, um, there is no showstopper for H2 salt storage and there are few existing storages in the world. Do these storages operate with some cyclicity objective like for gas storage, uh, meaning injecting and summer pumping during winter? Uh, any specific issue, geomechanics or other related to H2 due to hydrogen volumetric storage density? That's from Jean-Luc Formanto. Thank you, Arnaud. <laughs> um, we we, we um, didn't get a lot of return of experiment for the um, um, hydrogen existing hydrogen storage caverns uh, today. Uh, but uh, for example, we know from from the cavern from T side that they are operated by brine compensation systems. That that means that uh, you have to inject the, the hydrogen in the cavern and withdraw brine. And uh, when you want to withdraw the hydrogen, you reject brine and withdraw the hydrogen. And the result is that the the pressure inside the cavern is relatively flat. Uh, and so there is not too much um, mechanical stress uh, on the cavern, and it's quite different of, of what we know for uh, gas storage cavern, where, where when we work from a maximum uh, and a minimum pressure, the stress is uh, very different. Uh, so, uh, T side is probably not a good example. Uh, to, to understand what could be the, the behavior of hydrogen and uh, the, the problematics. After that, there is no very specific specific aspect of hydrogen in question of um, mechanical aspect because it's not depending of the, the density of the gas or of the, the specificity of hydrogen in comparison with with um, with uh, methane, for example. Uh, because you you just apply a pressure at the at the wall of the cavern and uh, hydrogen pressure or methane pressure uh, doesn't make any difference in fact so um, it is it is not very difficult the, the the density could play a role between the pressure at the top of the cavern and the pressure at the bottom. It's quite a little different because, of course, hydrogen density is very low, but density of, of uh, natural gas from the upper part of the cavern and the, the bottom part of the cavern, it's a question of bars, one, two, maybe five bars, and with hydrogen, uh, less than one bar for sure, but that doesn't make big difference finally so i think there is no real problematics with uh, with uh, energy and uh, uh, mechanical aspect after that of course to use hydrogen for energy we plan to have a um, frequency of operation injection with the world different from what we know from the the existing cavern uh, because for the the, the use uh, the, the actual use of this cavern, uh, they they withdraw small quantity of hydrogen for for the the use for the hydrocarbon refinery, and it, it, there is no um, uh, very um, frequent uh, cycles of of withdrawal. It, uh, but we know that for for gas. Probably we will have a more frequent cycle uh, with hydrogen because the production is uh, more viable with renewables than for, for gas where we are working with a more flat uh, production of gas. Uh, but uh, nothing uh, 
challenging in, in this in this aspect. We 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 know how to manage uh, cycling in the cavern today, high frequency cycling if necessary. Yes, <laughs> yeah, just to, just to mention, uh, there is, for instance, um, uh, the early kid uh, cavern in in Speed the Top in in uh, Texas in the U.S. The um, the pressure cycle is is published, I think, in an I think it's published in an in a uh, deliverable that is available on their websites. And it's um, as I said, it's a feedstock. Uh, it's used as a feedstock for hydrogen, and um, and uh, it's more or less um, used. Uh, as it's similar to what we have in seasonal uh, cycling in in salt caverns. So it's not very very uh, strong cycles with very steep uh, pressure changes. Thank you. Um, I will ask the two last questions that we have online and then uh, we can uh, go ahead with the people in the room. And uh, for the people in the room, we'll continue to ask questions if you want during the small uh, cocktail we have after. <laughs> Um, so one of the questions is to secure the storage investment and ensure the public safety. Is there any EU regulation to monitor potential leakage through wells or structure in place at the moment? I may take this one because I think it's no one uh, <laughs> has opened up his mic. Um, so do we need uh, EU regulation on existing assets? Um, I, I um, <clears throat> Probably we need uh, regulation. I, we also need to show that this industry uh, is, is safe. And um, I will refer here to um, an initiative that was launched by an um, an American association called SMRI, so it's only, it's only for salt, uh, but um, it it gathers more or less the um, salt cavern industry, and they maybe uh, ten years ago they started um, uh, requesting uh, creating databases of what happened, all incidents that did happen uh, in this uh, salt cavern industries, and I I worked on that, I coordinated these efforts, and um, at the end over. 2,000 salt caverns operating for sometimes more than 70 years. We found 21 events uh, in this database. Uh, this database was built in order to uh, to to have a, a synthesized uh, a view of what happened. A few pages that they explain uh, based on uh, available public knowledge as best as we could what happened technically to avoid this for happening again. So. My message is that, um, uh, of course, this, uh, this uh, safety and past incidents have to be looked at. It, it did happen in some cases. Uh, we we know that we um, we worked to understand what happened. We worked uh, to make it safer and to and to uh, uh, to bring in these the lessons learned from these experiences in our designs today. And many things have been brought, like a uh, concept of double barrier, like the me mechanical integrity tests. Um, so many improvements have been brought, and um, a researcher from BGS, uh, also a dozen years ago, uh, tried to um, compare the incidents from the salt cavern industry, uh, and also the porous media storage industry, and uh, Marco Gas also uh, did works on, on more generally, on also including porous media on the past incidents. So uh, David Evans from BGS, um, trying to compare um, uh, the safety of storing uh, uh, products underground compared to uh, the safety of, of storing uh, them above ground and compare basically the, the underground oil and gas storage industry to the to the other parts of the of the oil and gas industry and found that it's the, it's it's safer so um and there are reasons for that as uh, Grégoire said there is no oxygen underground uh, it's less prone to uh, to uh, human errors or human attacks. Uh, it's less prone to a seismic uh, risk. So there are reasons for that. And uh, this uh, historical analysis showed that it is uh, safer for the oil and gas industry. So I think we have to build on that and we will build on that for hydrogen storage. Um. 
on the regulation aspect, uh, and from my uh, experiment with the uh, IEPSTER project, uh, I can say that it's it's a new uh, topic for administration. So we have no real rules today. So we build the rules uh, from our experiment of uh, natural gas storage. Uh, but uh, for sure, it's new. And when it's new, uh, we have not the, the structure of, of uh, regulation uh, as we can have for natural gas today. Uh, so we are discussing. Uh, we have a lot of discussion with uh, with the, the French administration in the case of the project. Uh, we try to estimate uh, the the impact of such uh, storage in case of uh, accident, in case of everything, uh, as we do for uh, for for natural gas storage too. One thing is different with hydrogen. Is that the, the when you have when if we imagine a, a, um, a blowout, for example, uh, with a fire, uh, the fire of hydrogen is less um, um, radiant. With there is less thermal effect, or the thermal effect are shorter than with methane. But the effect of uh, surpressure is is uh, larger. So we have to change a little our uh, software in in our mind to say that the distance uh, of impact uh, are not exactly the same and we have to take into account the specificity of hydrogen for safety uh, but it is uh, yeah in discussion and in discussion also with the administration to 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 have the good hypothesis uh, to take into account uh, in case of um, accident scenario i don't know if i answer to the question but i hope <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry for the people online. I have to rush my question now because we're talking about safety. Uh, hydrogen being a very escaping gas, as mentioned, uh, I would like to know uh, what are the techniques deployed in the storage sites uh, that are already in place to monitor a potential leakage, a gas leakage uh, in the sites. Um, so the yeah, uh, particularly in mine mine caverns. So, <laughs> so um, uh, just to to make sure, uh, current the, the industry currently is in mine caverns is not storing hydrogen; it is storing essentially um, LPG and uh, and and uh, and liquid hydrocarbons, not not uh, not gases. Um, and um, so the, the I mean we have uh, we have uh, um, several monitoring um, monitorings of uh, of the integrity of a storage. First, before commissioning, in both uh, in both salt or mine caverns, there are uh, acceptance tests. So the the cavern is is um, is pressurized at the test pressure. For mine caverns, it's with compressed air, and um, and there is. Um, then a detailed analysis of uh, of how the cavern pressure behaves at the at this uh, pressure, at which is which is above the pressure that will be uh, that, that can be met during the operational life of the cavern, and um, and effects like thermal effects like uh, like uh, uh, water this uh, water um, going the gas phase or air dissolution, and other effects are taken into to account and are taken out. And to enable to uh, to uh, from the measurement at the maximum pressure to uh, to 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 identify or not a possible leak. So first, caverns are tested, and they are tested, and they they are put into operation uh, if the test if they pass uh, successfully the test. And these tests are act actually very accurate uh, compared to what you could find in, the, in terms of percentage of the. The accuracy of the test as a percentage of what is stored is much, much smaller, much better than what you can find in uh, surface storage equipments. And um, and during the operation life uh, of, of a cavern, uh, you will have uh, uh, water wells. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, um, sorry, monitoring wells. 
um, in uh, in overlying aquifers in the in the curtain uh, water um, uh, of the of the cavern. So you will have this monitoring wells that would be the first the first uh, geological layer uh, strata that would be made by a, any possible leakage that has are used as uh, early uh, warning signs. Uh, you also uh, monitor uh, the stability of your cavern. You monitor, um, yeah. Uh, you you monitor the mass you inject, the mass you withdraw, of course, the pressure of your cavern. You monitor the pressure of your water in mine caverns, of your water around the cavern, and you make sure that this pressure is always higher than the pressure of the producer in your cavern. So the water will flow in the cavern, and you will take it take it out, and not the opposite. So this is for mine cavern, the, which was your question. This is actually for a little bit for unlined mine cavern, um, which is not really considered for hydrogen, where there is more lined, more mine cavern with a with a liner. Yeah, for for salt cavern, uh, we we have a concept of uh, well, well, the salt is naturally very tight, with the permeability very very low. Uh, we are speaking of uh, uh, 10 to the minus of 20 uh, square meter, so it's it's uh, very very tight naturally. And so the question is the tightness of the well, and uh, we have a system in the well with a double barrier in Europe, uh, where the, there is uh, two two casing, a cemented casing and a special casing. Uh, production casing in the well, uh, separated by uh, an annulus um, filled with water. And so if you lose um, the tightness of your first barrier, you 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 have um, you can detect a, a leak of the first barrier in the annulus. And so it's a, it's a way to be sure that uh, you have the tightness of your first barrier and you have a second barrier in case of, uh, of leak. Uh, after that, uh, we have uh, yeah a lot of safety valve and yeah process to be to be sure that everything is safe uh, underground safety valve in case of problem on the wellhead uh, with I don't know a crash of a plan or a big problem like this and uh, all the all the valve are fail safe so closed uh, um, normally normally closed uh, so. We have different level of safety and different level of, of um, control, and we continue to monitor to have uh, to, to follow the evolution of the cavern by a sonar survey inside the cavern. Uh, your, Jean, Jean Paul knows that very well, uh, and and yeah, to check all these these different aspects to control the quantity of gas, the stock evolution, and as uh, yeah, so. We have a very we have um, more than forty years of, of uh, experiment with with that uh, with natural gas and so it could be applied very easily for with uh, hydrogen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if there is one more question in the room, we can take it maybe uh, for the people online. Uh, I will keep all your questions and comments and pass it to the speakers and we will answer you by email. Um, we are sorry we need to stop soon because we are already 25 minutes late. <laughs> but it's a very interesting topic, so please, Patrick, ask your question. Maybe a uh, last one. It has been mentioned before, so the hydrogen large-scale storage will provide the services to the gas grid and the power grid as well, because it stores intermittent energy. And you mentioned the multi-cycling factor, which is different comparing what we experience for natural gas storage. And obviously, this factor will play a role on the final cost of storage for the customers. And so, do you have some order of magnitude? I've seen in a storage project, there is a work package dedicated just to the sector coupling effect on the, the gas storage. So, do you have any numbers to share with the audience? Mm. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, so first, this uh, this work package has uh, delivered its work, and it will be published in a few weeks or months. So uh, I, I hope weeks. So um, <clears throat> and these costs are costs are we uh, are given for typical designs. So as you know, it's always case specific. So it has to be um, 
considered uh, as such. And also they are split in two parts, one that is proportional to the flow rate of your facility and what is that is uh, proportional to the to the capacity of your storage. Uh, because actually you, 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 we find uh, both sources of, of cost in, uh, in our underground storage. Um, but if you look at, uh, to come to the point, if you want a, a number uh, for a typical design, we are at about two euro uh, per kilo of hydrogen. For a typical site. My question was more about the multi cycling factor. So, oh. how many times you cycle the a cavern a year? So, uh, we also worked on that. Uh, another deliverable in the high stories. Um, and uh, it's uh, a German comp consulting company called LBST that has a model. And at each time step, which is an hour, they model uh, the production of energy in Europe uh, as a consumption. And it's uh, it's also uh, with a with a special grid, and uh, they introduce uh, uh, hydrogen storage as one of the flexibility of the system that enable to meet match at each time step production and consumption. So they did uh, preliminary pre preliminary results, and this one are already available on Hydrogen's website. For each of the EU 27 plus UK countries, they give you a number of cycles depending on several uh, um, scenarios. For instance, for France, uh, it goes from one to four cycles per year. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can close this event. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Special thank you to our um, speakers, to Nicola from Polavenia as well, and thank you to our two moderators for tonight. Um, so, uh, as I said, for the people here, you can stay and uh, keep asking some questions or discussing with our speakers. We'll be happy to have you uh, around the drink. And uh, for the people online, we'll post the video in a few days um, if you want to watch it again. And uh, thank you for attending and uh, hope to see you online on our next event. <laughs>